לא? Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Breaking into Retail. Uh, it's a program of the CCOF Foundation, uh, one of the three organizations within CCOF. We're really excited to have you on the line for our, uh, today. We have some great uh, participants here. If you um, are having difficulties, you can't hear or you can't see, please call our office for support. Uh, the number is 831-423-2263 extension 87 and or 831-423-2263 extension 10 and there'll be somebody there on the line to help you um, get onto the program. Uh, just a quick thing about how to participate today. Uh, for many of you this might be your first WebEx event. If so, welcome to WebEx. Um, on the right hand side you'll see um, a very large panel and it has a bunch of information and things scrolling by it. Um, you can switch functions um, between participants uh, chatting and question and answer. You can also open and close your panels if you'd like to have a broader screen view of the presentation. And you do that by clicking the bar at the top. You can also submit text questions and comments and we really encourage you as the presentation is continuing to write in and say, hey, I've got a question for Donna or I have a question for Jessica um, or hey, I can't hear you well enough. Anything that has to do with technology and or the presentations, you can put into the chat box or the question and answer box on the right hand side and we will be able to see you. You can also communicate directly with presenters by using the, the drop down menu at the bottom of the chat function um, and choosing a specific presenter if you would like to target your questions to people. Uh, and lastly, if you would like to speak on today's webinar, it's kind of like a radio call-in show, you can raise your hand and the raise your hand function is in the middle. Um, middle bar, you'll see on the right hand side of this slide, um, there's a little hand with a box around it. And if you, wanna, um, if you want to uh, be heard um, online and in radio kind of broadcast form, you can um, speak through your phone. So that's it. We've got some really great uh, presenters on the line today. Very excited. Um, so first off, we're going to have Harv Singh. Um, and Jade Burnham from Whole Foods Market. Um, Harv travels all over the West Coast in search of exceptional local farmers and food markets so he can bring their goods to the shelves of Whole Foods Market. Harv is more than just a talent scout for great flavor. He also mentors small businesses and helps them grow through the Whole Foods Local Producers Loan Program. And Jade started with Whole Foods in 2007. Her current position is based in Northern California and she serves as the Area Vendor Support Specialist. Jade works with producers to complete the paperwork and audits necessary to sell at Whole Foods. So they'll be speaking first. Then we'll have Donna Skye, who's the owner of the Love and Hummus Company. Um, Love and Hummus Company is a San Francisco-based artisan food company that handcrafts organic hummus and Mediterranean foods. Raising the bar in the category, Love and Hummus offers the only locally manufactured certified organic hummus in Northern California and the only fresh hummus in the country offered in BPA-free and 100% recyclable glass jars. Love & Hummus has been successful at breaking into a variety of retail markets. Their products are now available in San Francisco's iconic Ferry Building and Phil's Coffee, specialty retailers like Whole Foods Market, New Leaf, and Andronica's Community Market, as well as online through Williams Sonoma and Good Eggs. And uh, lastly, we'll have Jessica Rolfe, who's the far founding partner and COO of Happy Family. Happy Family is a leading premier organic food brand delivering optimal nutrition for the entire family. Happy Family has been very successful at gaining access to large retail markets and was named one of the fastest growing organic food companies in the nation by Inc. Magazine for two years running. Before joining Happy Baby, which is now Happy Family, in 2005, Jessica worked on site as the national office um, of Whole Foods Market in Austin, Texas as the account manager for SPIN, the leading information provider for the natural products industry. And lastly, we have Jana Schmidt, who's here in our CCOF office, and she'll be here um, not as a presenter per se, but she's here to answer questions about organic certification for breaking into retail. Uh, Jana is a cedar certification specialist here at CCOF. She works mainly with small and large processors to certify their products as organic, and is also part of our retail team, which certifies our retail clients like Whole Foods Market and New Leaf Market. Prior to CCOF, uh, Jana worked as a marketing and training specialist at Whole Foods Market in Northern California. 
And lastly, my name is Jesse Beckett, and I am the Foundation Program Coordinator here at CCOF. And it's my pleasure to be able to put on educational events like this as part of the CCOF Foundation. So wanted to welcome you all again, and thank you for being on the line. If you have additional questions, please do um, text in or chat in on the right-hand side, and we'll be happy to, um, to get those answered. So first, we're going to have Harv Singh today. Um, who is calling in from a conference in Seattle. Thank you so much for being on the line with us, Harv. And um, you and Jade can uh, take it away, and we're going to give you the controls so you're able to scroll. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jan, I didn't know you were going to be on this call. That's awesome. We used to work uh, together. And uh, let's see if I could get this thing... We've noticed that you have a hello. Hello. Something's happening here. Is this webcam supposed to work? Somebody, hello? You guys, is everyone there? Yes, we're here. Oh, okay. Um, so you, you all see this, this slide under topics covered? Yes. Yeah, hello? Yep. We can see you, Arf. Oh, you can see me. Yep. We're good to go. All right, go for it. Oh, okay, great. I was going to say hi, Jana. We used to work together at Whole Foods. It's awesome. I didn't know you were on this uh, as one of the presenters. Um, so I'm just going to talk about what what a forager kind of does for the region and how we support local suppliers, and then uh, we'll talk about Jade's role. I go into how we define local in NorCal. Um, and uh, how we do our sourcing from a store, regional to national. And then uh, Jade will talk about the onboarding process, some of our quality standards. And I'll kind of talk about what I look for in, in companies and partnering uh, and, and, and building relationships. And we'll talk about sort of uh, the next evolution of local, which is transparency in the supply chain. And then I'll talk about sort of our innovative loan program. Um, so I, I started... Uh, about 12 years ago, I got my start uh, in running farmers markets in Port Townsend, Washington. And, and I would say the biggest thing I learned from there was this sense of community. It's like why we support the whole local growing uh, produce movement is that we create these really authentic, real, direct experiences. Uh, and it's all about really celebrating community. Um, I learned that early on by running a farmers market on the North Olympic Peninsula, then moved to the Bay Area. Uh, started my own farmer's market and got to know um, um, the entire local food scene here in the Bay Area and, and did a bunch of work with farmer's markets organizations, launched my own market, and I joined Whole Foods Market in, in 2006, and I've been in this role um, ever since uh, then. And, and I would say in, in, you know, since 2006, probably mentored over uh, well over 700 uh, local companies through our loan program. We have loaned uh, by now close to a million dollars to about 30 producers. So that's been a really exciting role. Um, I kind of see my, you know, my mission is, is really to cultivate relationships with our suppliers um, and help them grow. And part of that really is, again, going back to community. It's all about sort of fostering a sense of community and purpose uh, with our local program. And along the way, hopefully, we do some great things like reshape uh, uh, and, and rebuild uh, a broken food system that's, that's based on transparency, uh, traceability, uh, ethical uh, sourcing, and, and, and always 
great tasting products. I mean, that's that's at the foremost of, of everything that, that we do as foragers is we're always looking for great tasting products. Um, that is safe as well. And more than ever now, I would say when I'm looking at a company, I'm looking at your, qual your food quality standards. What do you have in place? Do you have a third-party food safety audit? And we'll talk about that a little bit later because now that is more than ever is that we want you to have a third-party food safety audit. We want to know that the food supply chain is absolutely safe for our customers. Um, my role as forager, so I basically cover all departments uh, and lately been picking up more growers. Uh, that had not been an area of focus lately, but I have onboarded a lot of growers. Um, I'm heavy in grocery, but I do ranchers and, and uh, um, uh, specialty items all across all departments. Um, and it's really, again, the goal, my goal is to build relationships, long-term relationships that we can grow one store at a time, sometimes regionally, sometimes multi-regionally, and sometimes nationally. And, it's, and it can be a little hard navigating the, the whole food system because it's very sort of decentralized. Each store kind of operates like its own little uh, entity and company. Uh, they're really empowered. Um, at the store level. And um, I also manage our uh, local producer loan program, which I'll talk about later. It's a very kind of innovative uh, in-house uh, loan program that the Whole Foods administers, administers at the regional level. Um, and there is a national loan coordinator, but it's basically micro loans, uh, small, uh, low interest micro loans to existing producers that need to uh, scale up their business. So they're wanting to purchase, you know, like livestock or or, um, or equipment or they want to get uh, certified organic or or, go, or pay for non-GMO or gluten-free testing, uh, some of those things. And I also act as a mentor uh, and a support system because sometimes it can be a little difficult navigating the Whole Foods channel. Um, I also work a lot with our partners in uh, in growing uh, the whole local food economy, and I also work closely with our regional buyers and coordinators uh, to uh, introduce them with the new suppliers that I think uh, are of uh, growth category, um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that, some examples of that, like the whole local grain economy with community grains. These are just kind of a snapshot of some of the brands that we have developed. There's Three Twins uh, Ice Cream. I remember meeting them in, in 2006 at a Berkeley market. They were just operating out of an old freezer truck. Uh, today they're a nationally recognized brand, and they're the highest selling organic ice cream on our shelves. Um, community Grains kind of re uh, you know, doing a local grain economy, working with local wheat growers and local millers and bakers and creating some really great innovative products uh, that are 100% whole grain, um, stone milled, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Ritual Coffee, St. Benoit Yogurt, they're part of our loan program. Uh, In a Jam, which started as a, as a bicycle delivery. Uh, she's delivering uh, jams on bicycle, and today she's kind of expanded uh, her business. And then um, some other companies, Bar Gelato, which we gave an exclusive loan to develop uh, gelatos. Uh, on a on a on a stick, basically. Um, a little bit about Whole Foods, um, as you may not be aware, but um, you know Whole Foods is very different to work with than traditional retailers. Um, we have over uh, 355 stores. We have planned. Most of you guys have probably heard in the media. Uh, we plan to grow to a thousand stores within 10 years. Um, we have over, you know. 76,000 team members. We're a very mission-driven company, um, you know, and we live by core values. Uh, and you can go onto our website and learn about our seven values. If you wanted to really understand Whole Foods and know who you're doing business with, we live and breathe these core values. And they're kind of listed on our website. I'm not going to go over those. Um, in Northern California, we have 40 stores. We plan to open two more at the end of this year. Uh, the San Jose in Alameda, which is will be our second San Jose store across from the San Jose Shark Tank. We'll have our second uh, Berkeley store uh, uh, San, at, near San Pablo and Gilman at the end of this year, too. We also have new Lisa signed it at uh, 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 Dublin, California, and then also our second store in Walnut Creek. 
Uh, we also opened a new distribution center in Richmond uh, in the spring of 2013, and that presents a lot of opportunities as well for local suppliers to go through our, our distribution. Um, it is probably three, four times bigger than what we used to have in, in our South San Francisco office. Um, you know, I'm not really kind of not going to go into why buy local. I mean, there's, there's a lot of benefits to the environment. Um, again, I want to go back to this, you know, about, about community because it really is about, for us, about, so, about fostering, you know, authentic experiences and fostering community. Um, between our growers, our customers, our family, friends, kind of everyone in this food shed. Um, let's see, get to know Whole Foods. You know, as I talked about this before, um, if people don't know what Whole Foods is all about, and if you want to build a relationship with us, really get to know who we are. Visit our stores. Look at how our merchandising is done. Know and understand our core values because we live by them. Um, each store is, is really, again, kind of functions as its own company. Each store has a marketing coordinator, a demo specialist, a sign maker, an accounting department. I mean, we really are designed and, um, so that we can respond to, cu to customer needs. And we're also making a lot of purchasing dishes at the store level. So if you're a small local producer um, and you want to introduce your product to one store, um, you can go to any store and ask to meet with a buyer. Um, and they're empowered to make these uh, decisions. We're also a very mission-driven company. We care a lot about our um, about our communities that that we serve. If you wanted to learn more about our foundations, like our whole trade, whole kids, whole planet, um, uh, whole you know all of that stuff, I, I'm not going to go into it. But you should get to know uh, these foundations, uh, and it's all on our website. The quality standards we. Um, and food safety, again, those are some of the, you know, the, the most important things, I would say, in, in our onboarding process these days. You know, right, you know, that's the first thing we ask for uh, is an ever-clean audit, and Jade will go into that. Um, Whole Foods is innovative. I think one of the things that we really pride on ourselves is innovation. We're always coming out with new concepts, like putting in pubs and bars, uh, inside our stores, if you go to like the like the new San Jose store is going to have a brewery and a rooftop garden. A lot of our stores have like beer pubs and tap rooms. Uh, those are pretty innovative stuff. Um, our whole uh, city's foundation looks at you know building stores in um, economically depressed neighborhoods uh, throughout the country. So I would say Whole Foods is a very innovative. Uh, company, and we're always looking to differentiate. We're always looking for key differentiators. We're always looking for product innovation. More than ever now, you know, we're looking at products that are just not, uh, you know, the same granola, the same jams. Or how how are suppliers innovating themselves? What are they doing to to really set themselves apart? It could be new packaging. It could be something about your your mission driven. It could be about some of the sustainability initiatives. It's a new product category, like working with local grains or, or coming out with new products. You, more than ever now, as, as food entrepreneurs, you really have to innovate because it's a very competitive la landscape out there. Um, how is local product sourced? So, you know, I mentioned a little bit about this, is that if you're an entrepreneur out there and you want to get your product introduced to Whole Foods, you can walk into any local Whole Foods stores and ask to meet with a buyer. And that buyer, you make an appointment and you can do a pitch. Uh, they are trained and empowered uh, to make those decisions at the store level. And then once uh, they make that decision, if they want to onboard that product, they'll work with Jade and I, especially with Jade, with all the onboarding documents. Again, Jade is going to go over that. Uh, we have regional buyers and product coordinators at the regional level that follow a category review schedule. And a category review schedule is basically certain categories come up for review certain times of the year. So say right now we're looking at uh, maybe it could be the cereal, granola, uh, or you know the nut bars. Um, and then you submit your products to the regional buyer and in order to be considered uh, for regional placement, you have to be able to serve at least 90% of our stores. Um, and you need to have a secured method of distribution, so working with one of our distributors. We also have a regional produce buying office uh, at RDC. And actually, our global uh, office is in Watsonville for a produce that purchases produce for the entire company. Um, 
And we also hope to be, uh, we have a, a new initiative uh, for a local vendor portal, which is going to make it a really kind of streamline the process of new vendors uh, wanting to do business with us. You can go to this portal and learn exactly how to do business with us, and you'll be able to submit your products uh, that way as well. So that's something exciting that's in the works. Category review schedule, I did talk a little bit about that. Uh, the schematic or in the planogram, which is, you know, this little, um, you know, this colorful map of, 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 this, of the set. You know, that's uh, sometimes when you're ready for regional placement, you want to be in the planogram. And the planogram then are flushed down to the store level, and the stores go, okay, this is where the product goes. So it's kind of like a guaranteed shelf placement. Um, uh, well, actually, nothing is really guaranteed. It ba is really based on product performance uh, as well. So, um, how we define local? You know, basically anything that's produced, manufactured, grown, made, uh, caught, roasted, whatever, in Northern California, and you're based in this region as well. That's how we define local. Um, and that, you know, each region is going to define local differently. But in Northern California. Basically, all of the counties that you see here um, is you would be considered as a local supplier. Um, transparency, yeah, I would say like moving forward, you know, some of the like we just did a local rebrand, and it's not about um, you know food miles. It's more about being transparent in your in your practices. We want to know where your stuff is grown, how it's made um, for growers. What are you know what are you doing to uh, protect the soil? What are some of the environmental systems that you guys are employing as a grower, as a rancher, as a producer? Uh, we want to create transparencies. Um, if you're in our bulk department selling grains and rice and lentils, you know, we want to know when, when, it, when the date was harvested. Uh, we want to know where it was coming from, um, if we can isolate the exact grower. So more and more our customers want to know more about the food supply because they want to feel safe about the food that they're eating and they want to be able to have these authentic experiences in really high quality products. So I think you know, that, that's some of the things that are changing uh, about how we define local. Um, the onboarding process, you know, I'm going to let Jade um, kind of take over uh, this portion. Okay, hi y'all. Um, so for our onboarding process, uh, a lot of the documents are something that once you have initiated a relationship with a buyer, they're going to give you the paperwork. But the things that is really important about coming to the table and having on hand is a third-party audit. And that's going to entail everything from like a GMP and a HACCP plan. And, you know, if your product is, you know, has a greater shelf life than seven days, like you're going to have to have, you know, a shelf life, and life analysis. And um, just, you know, all these little things that help, you know, protect your company and protect Whole Foods and our customers in the long run. Um, another thing that you're going to need is insurance. Um, right now, our requirements range from a million dollars per occurrence to three million, depending on uh, what classification your product falls in, between, you know, standard and high risk, specialty risk. Um, you're going to have to, like, provide all your different permits and licenses to make sure, you know, you're registered with, like, the uh, Biohazard Act through uh, the FDA. And so, um, we actually have a we have a person that we work with um, called Everclean, and they do the majority of our stuff. But if you also have like a comparable third party audit, you know we can accept that as well. The main thing is just you know we want to have proof and that transparency of you know these are your practices and and just ensuring for our customers that they that it's being prepared in a safe environment. Um, another thing that's really important is a. Uh, being able to uh, provide like auto insurance and workers comp, you know, especially if you have your employees coming onto Whole Foods premises, you know, we want to make sure that um, they're covered in case there's any accidents. So that's another really big thing to cover. Harv? Just to add, um, th this process, this onboarding process can seem a little daunting, but Everclean has been just a really great partner for us, and they totally walk you through the entire process. Like, you know, I have to write a good manufacturing plan. Oh, my God, what is that? They, they'll send you a template, and they'll guide you, like, well, this is what a good manufacturing plan looks like. Or an employee sickness policy. It's like, oh, my God, I've, I've never written an employee sickness policy. They kind of guide you through this entire process. Um, and, a, and, and like a product recall plan. Like, well, 
have you ever done a mock recall? Have, you know, what does your product recall plan look like? Um, and they really do walk you through the entire process. And, and Jade is here as well, too, and she's a tremendous resource and, and support. So initially it may seem like daunting, but once, once you get it together, it, it's kind of like it's a very enlightening process, too, and you'll feel glad that you did all of this. And not only that, but your customers uh, will feel uh, safe that hey, okay, I've, got, I've done I've done a third party food safety audit. I'm you know I'm very proud of this as well, and I learned some things along the way too. So it is required, but it doesn't have to be daunting, and we try to make it uh, kind of as, as painless as possible. Yeah, we have lots of you know templates to help you create your own drafts of these, and you know the Everclean people are really good about getting back to your emails about questions, and I'm here as well to help guide you through the process. Um, let's see, new local grower approval process. I will say that we have a new uh, local grower process that's going to be launching out in the fall. And it's all about looking at your practices. And, and you will have to log in to this website and, um, and fill out your current practices, and you'll be rated on these practices. I'm not going to go too much... Uh, into that. It hasn't launched. It's still in its pilot stages right now. But currently, if you're a grower, this is what we're looking at. You will need to have a, uh, a, a, a good agricultural uh, a plan. You will need to have a, a, a food safety plan, a recall plan. Um, and again, we've partnered with the California Alliance of Family Farmers to help you write this plan. We, we want to look at, again, food safety is the most important thing here. Um, so you do need to have a good agricultural uh, plan uh, or a good manufacturing plan for your farm. Um, organic vendors, I mean, some of the basic stuff, uh, organic certificate, um, growers, handlers. And if you are processing, uh, we will need a HACCP plan as well. Uh, the current projects. So I'll kind of highlight some of the current projects that uh, that I'm working on right now. This, this is a picture of Bob Klein. He owns the restaurant in Oakland and Rockridge called Olivetto's. But he has a company called Community Grains in which he works with uh, local growers like um, like uh, Full Belly Farms uh, in growing these sort of wheat, uh, old wheat varieties. And then uh, it's milled, it's 100% whole grain, uh, stone milled, and then he creates these really wonderful line of uh, products with it. Um, some pasta uh, to start out with. Uh, so that's kind of an exciting, really exciting opportunity. And we've been working with Bob, and we recently launched a cookie program uh, with our partnership with the Rubicon Bakery. And it's a 100% whole grain stone milled cookie. Uh, it does extremely well uh, in our stores. And the reason why I talk about this is because this is developing a new category. Like how exciting to sort of reclaim this local grain economy by working with our you know local wheat farmers and lo local millers and local bakers. Um, that's a really exciting high growth opportunity uh, that we see. And, and, and um, uh, let's see, this is part of the street food movement. is is you know is is really hot. This is Magic Curry Cart. He was sort of, sort of one of the original uh, street food vendors, and he came out with this line of uh, a curry paste, which was just awesome. Uh, so we worked with him from the street food level to concept to bringing it to one store to five stores, and now he's looking for a core packer to expand it uh, regionally. He's recently raised money on Kickstarter to do that. La Casina, we work with a lot of uh, uh, sort of nonprofit uh, kitchen incubators, and La Casina is really an awesome kitchen incubator that works with low-income women uh, minorities, mostly women minorities in San Francisco. And this is Beanie, uh, Beanie's Kitchen, and she's um, kind of a new to the scene, uh, does, does Nepalese foods. Um, and so we're working with her to bring her into Whole Foods, and she does a really awesome ne Nepalese dumpling. Uh, this is um, Azalina, uh, also from La Casina. Azalina is uh, from uh, Penang Island, and uh, she makes some incredible peanut sauce and coconut jam. So we worked with her. Uh, to develop uh, uh, this retail line product. She also sells in our hot bar in some of our San Francisco stores. 
And she just recently graduated from La Cocina. She has her own commercial kitchen now. She's opening a restaurant uh, on Market Street, part of the, that new development. And uh, so we're working with her now in growing and becoming a regional player. Um, this is Alexander Kidd's farm. It, it's so awesome to, to meet this family. It's one of the sort of, I think, one of the really hidden egg suppliers way up in Crescent City near the Oregon border. Uh, they run uh, their uh, their outdoor chickens with uh, with their uh, dairy cows. And, you know, what's so exciting about this is that they have lush year-round green pastures, and it's a single-family farm, and they're working on uh, being certified biodynamic. And that's one of the other things that we're really pushing is, you know, um, you know, how can we move beyond uh, and, uh, sustainable practices and, and move into holistic practices, uh, looking at the whole farm holistic approach. And these guys are hopefully going to be one of the first egg suppliers in the country that's going to be biodynamic certified. Um, you know, I, I must say that we have really good relationships with our local growers that spans 15, 20 years. Uh, this is uh, Swantonberry Farms. Uh, it's Jim Cochran. It's Full Belly Farm. Um, you know, again, these days, if, if, if you're a new grower coming to us, it's like, you know, you've you got to be able to think out of the box and, you know, not present the same things that, that we have abundances. You've got to really think out of the box and go, you know, what, what are some new varieties I could plant? Maybe it's like you know, open pint, heirloom, you know, you know, sweet and spicy, you know, frying peppers. Maybe, you know, heirloom varieties are, are, are really hot right now. So you kind of like have to experiment and grow things that are really different and innovative. You can't just grow the same old stuff um, and expect to get into Whole Foods. Um, this is Chan um, Lee when we opened. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say to add on to what you, you were saying, Harv, um, another big thing is that uh, once you get into the stores is, you know, making sure you budget to market your products and, you know, drive your brand, do demos, sample, 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 <laughs> you know, get people trying your product. That's that's a really great idea. Most people, when they do their budgets, you know, they they just think, oh, I'm, I'm in Whole Foods now, and it's like, and that's the easy part. No, the, the journey actually begins when you when you get in. You know, I, I, I mean... <laughs> I don't want to say the easy part is getting into Whole Foods, but the real work begins when your product is on the shelf and you go, all right, now what do I do? And most of the companies don't, you know, allocate enough funds to, to marketing and demos and promos. Um, highly encourage that. That's a really great point. Um, this is just an example of the grower. When we opened our Fremont store, we went to Sonola Act Park, and we tried to work with a lot of those growers and um, – and uh, we, but we brought on this uh, strawberry vendor, which was great. Um, you know, just to highlight some of our commitment to local organics, you know, local is a huge part of what we do, especially in produce. At the height of our local season, penetration of, of local is about 65%. We work well, with well over close to 200 local growers, and about 125 of them are small uh, growers that deliver directly to our stores, and that's what, what we call a, a, a DSD program a direct store delivery. Um, also, non-GMO sales are, are, are trending uh, 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 very much so right now. You know, I, I've been hearing a lot of debate about non-GMO and, or, and organics, you know, that we've been pushing non-GMOs to the point where people are forgetting about organics. And it's like, no, let's not forget about what certified organic means. We always want to be promoting certified organic and, and organically grown produce. Um, that's really important that we don't lose sight uh, of that. Um, what do I look for? You know, some of the things that I look for in companies are, are you know, sometimes more than the product and their food safety um, uh, protocols and, 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 uh, and high-quality products. Is I look at the people. I look at the people behind the product. And is this somebody that I can really build a relationship on? Are they committed to us? It's kind of like dating, and I'm really all about building long-term relationships. I'm not really interested in just unloading, you know, product through our distribution. I'm really thinking about, well, you know, how can we build a long-term relationship, you know, because we're, we're, we're in, in this together. I would really love um, to figure out, you know, what is the right plan for you? What are the right uh, crops or the, or the right products for you? Um, and work on this relationship. Always focus on quality. It's like quality and taste. That that should just be given. Uh, we're also looking at packaging. You know how sustainable, uh, recyclable, 
Um, uh, is your package, you know, are, are you a mission-driven company? You know, what are some of the values that you care about? Um, organics, we obviously want everybody to be certified organic, uh, non-GMO. Uh, we care about whole trade and fair trade, but we're really pushing people to become certified organic. I'm always talking about that. Uh, distribution is very important. How are you going to get it to our stores? Are you going to do direct distribution? Are you going to go through our distributor? Are you going to work with the distributor? We're looking at pricing. You know, um, sometimes we'll um, help you with with maybe getting a, a better deal on your cost of goods. Uh, most of the time, some of the stuff is priced to market or to margin, uh, but some of the stuff we re sometimes we know we just can't sell a $12 uh, uh, jar of jam. Uh, in, in our grocery aisle, so um, you know sometimes it's it's just priced out of the market, and and there are certain things we can sell, certain things we just can't, and sometimes it's not a fit a fit for Whole Foods. There's nothing wrong with just starting at farmers markets or CSAs or doing direct sales, and then working your way up to become a Whole food suppliers. Uh, marketing, we talked about that. Jade mentioned this, you know, demos, demos, demos to really driving awareness and repeat sales. Um, Let's see what else. Uh, saturated categories, kind of mentioned that a little bit. You know, food trends. You know, they're kind of exciting to look at food trends, but um, ultimately, I'm looking at you know what is it that you're doing that's really unique and that you do really good. Uh, food trends are fun, but I want to tap into your talent and know what you really do well. Um, Saint Benoit Creamery, some of the examples of goodness. I mean, this guy is all about you know sustainability. Um, he's not really about you know growing too fast or too big, but he does it in a way that is very conscious. Uh, he supports his local farmers, um, and these are his farmers. And his creamery is located right on the farm where he gets his milk. And this is the fifth generation uh, dairyman. He uh, has these sustainable, recyclable, uh, returnable crocs. Recently, he transitioned to four-ounce glass. We also loaned him money to do this um, uh, grass milk uh, program for us. Uh, there's his family. It's really about passing you know, his business down to his family and future generations. Uh, he's at the market here. He's really about supporting his local community. Uh, he sources everything locally, uh, gets his honey from the Marshall Farms. Um, and to him, it's really not about selling his company. It's really about passing it down to his kids. And this is Pierre. Um, this is in Two Rock Valley. It's about 1,000 acres. And he has 500 uh, Jersey cows on certified organic uh, land. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into our local producer loan program, but it does exist. Um, we give loans to existing suppliers, and it's about 25 to 50,000. And we're looking at categories and innovative companies that we can grow. Um, these are some of our loan recipients, uh, Benoit Creamery um, that we just talked about. And I think that was it. Um, kind of did a fast walkthrough here, but um, appreciate the opportunity uh, to present, and hopefully you guys kind of gained a little insight uh, into how to do business with Whole Foods, some of the things that we care about um, Thank you yeah, very much. Tarv, that was really wonderful. I really appreciate that you and Jade were both here. If folks have questions for either Harv or Jade, you can text them in right now. Or um, if you if you do want to uh, be able to raise your hand, you can do the raise your hand function. We have one that's been um, that was texted in just before. Um, so does Whole Foods take bath and body products that are not certified organic? And what are the steps needed to get uh, that type of product on the shelf? Is it the same as it would be for produce and or uh, processed goods? Um, I can I can answer that one. Um, so we do take uh, bath and body products. Um, there is a bit different of a product uh, process for that. We have um, we have a global coordinator who goes through and verifies the ingredients because a uh, with uh, body care, that does um, it does have to be a little bit more closely analyzed since it's so you know there's just so many different ingredients. So um, like all this stuff goes to her. Uh, there is a bit of um, 
uh, more strict thing as far as naming conventions go. Like if your product's not organic, like the brand name couldn't be ABC Organics. Uh, it, you know, if you're going to have, you know, organic claims, like your product has to be certified organic, uh, you know, depending on what type of claim you're making. So, um, but yes, we do. We do carry that. Um, I hate to do this to you guys. I have to go back. Um, if there's any specific questions for me, please send me an email. I'll be more than happy to follow up with you directly. Uh, but Jade is going to remain on and can answer any questions. If any questions you can't answer, please send me an email directly. Thanks so much, Harv. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be sure to get your email to everybody on the participant list. So thanks for being with us. Awesome. I'm so sorry I have to cut this short because I've got to go back to this conference room. But I'm looking forward to hearing what's out there. And if you have any questions, just please send me an email. All right. Thanks so much. So, Jay, okay. we have another question from one of the participants um, for your whole food team. And um, it's somebody who's an organic date farmer, and they're, they're wondering how can they work with Whole Foods to do something uh, that Whole Foods would want or like, and that's um, with dates. So do you have any suggestions for that type of um, marketing? Um, you know, that's actually a really good question for Harv. Harv um, has worked with a lot of uh, companies to, like, develop new products and stuff. So um, if you shoot him an email, he would – if he's not the one who could help you, he would at least be able to put you in touch with who would be a good person on our pros team to work with that. Okay. And then um, just as far as um, lining up the process, Jade, we had a question about um, using a broker or distributor. Harv did mention real quick that you guys have your own distribution um, company <laughs> and or service. Do you want to talk just a little bit about what that would look like if somebody wanted to use an external distributor? Um, so with the external distributor, uh, you could use, you know, we do business with a lot of large ones like Tony's Fine Foods, uh, UNFI, um, a lot of those larger distributors we do business with, and so um, it's if you are if you are already using them as, as a distributor, then all we would have to do is just set you up as a brand under them as your vendor. So it's a little bit more of a streamlined process. Um, as far as a, like a different distributor, like if you're using if you're going through a distributor that we don't currently use, then uh, we would still have to like complete like the whole new vendor process since it's still technically a new vendor. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, so we are tight on, on time right now, so we're going to continue to go in. If you have uh, additional questions, please um, text them in. Um, but we're going to turn it over to Donna Skye from the uh, Love & Hummus Company. So welcome, Donna. Thanks so much for being on the line. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, I just want to kind of check in, Jess, if you could just tell me about how much time I have so that I can make sure there's enough time for everybody to speak. Sure. Um, yeah. 15, 15 to 20 minutes would be great, Donna. Thanks. Okay, great, great. All right. So, all right. So, um, my name is Donna Skye, and um, before we get started, I'll just um, talk about a couple things up front. Yes, this is a New York or New Jersey accent. Um, so, uh, in case you're wondering, what is that accent? She talks funny. That's what it is. Um, and then, to just let you know, the first part, because of time, I'll go through rather quickly. Um, which is more about where we are, um, and then I'll get into the nitty-gritty of advice of how, you know, the advice that I offer to other vendors about breaking into retail. So Love and Hummus is a San Francisco-based artisan food company. Um, we're passionate about creating organic hummus and sustainable foods, and we are mission-driven. Uh, in 2009, I was a busy working mother, and I didn't have time to make the foods from my childhood. I, on my father's side of the family, they're um, Middle Eastern, so I grew up eating a lot of Middle Eastern and Eastern Mediterranean foods, and a lot of them take time to make. So, for example, the way we make hummus, I never open up a can of hummus and throw it in a food processor. I take a lot of care into where I source the chickpeas and where the tahini comes from and how fresh the spices are and, and finding all of those those supplies. And it's something, you know, you soak them overnight and you cook them. And the hummus that I was finding in the grocery stores didn't have that kind of homemade flavor that I was accustomed to. So I was working in education, and I wanted to switch over to food. So... The day before I launched my company, I mean, well, I launched my company. The day, the day before, 
I was looking on the Internet, and I saw that there was this shared commercial kitchen called La Cocina, which Harv spoke about a little bit. In the mission, they were having an orientation, and I thought, oh, this is a sign. And uh, I went to the orientation, and that began my journey with uh, with the Love and Hummus Company. So there are a few few things that really help us stand out from other products. Harv and Jay talked about this a lot. Um, you know, hummus is a crowded category, so we definitely fall into that area. Of, there's a lot of that being made already, but ours was different, and that was what we believe really helped us to not only get into places like Whole Foods and Andronico's and Saletti's and, and Williams Sonoma, but also most importantly with the customers and the people who buy our products every week. And some of those differences are that we are certified organic. So being certified organic and working with CCO up really has had a lot of value for us. Um, currently there is a little bit of um, I don't know, issue, but just it is definitely up. The, there's so much push for non-GMO, and unfortunately there's a lot of people that aren't, a lot of people don't know that being certified organic is actually the step beyond being non-GMO. There was a recent study, an article that came up, I believe, in the New York Times that said that many people are preferring non-GMO because they believe that that is um, better for you than organic. So. That's something as you get started to know, and I know CCOF, I've spoken to different people in CCOF saying that they're really on board and they want to educate people more, but also as a supplier yourself, it's important to really take that on and take the ownership and educate customers because we're the faces, we're the people out there, and ultimately it's our responsibility to really talk to our customers and and tell them why it's different and why it's important that you chose to be certified organic and um, not just non-GMO. Also, the type of packaging that you use, Whole Foods does care about that. Um, that was definitely something I know when I started calling stores, um, you know, when I told them I had a, an organic product, they were like, ah, we don't have any room on the shelf. But when I told them that it was not only certified organic, but that it was offered in BPA-free and recyclable glass jars, they were willing to have those meetings with me. So whenever you're considering growing or offering in the market, um, you know, my offer is suggestion is to, to think about the type of packaging that you have and, you know, have that follow all the way through. Um, where you source your ingredients, um, you know, CCOF was a great resource for me when I was, looking for suppliers, you know, because there is that list of, of, of different farms and different suppliers that um, that may grow some of the ingredients that you want to use for your products. So definitely look at that. And we are a value-based company. So we are an LLC, but we are a third-party verified C Corp. So it's something if, you know, if you're already certified organic and the things that you're doing are having a positive impact on the environment, B Corp may be a good option for you. So I started my company with four products and then eventually organically grew from there. Um, when other people who are starting out, because I'm in at La Cocina with a lot of people who are just starting, and my advice to people and what worked for me was to start with a smaller line of products and then get to know your customers, so having the four SKUs, and then grow from there, see what they're looking for. The two products that we launched after, I now have have about 12 products, but the two that I have on this page are toasted tahini, hummus, and the mukumara were natural progressions. These were things that our customers were asking for. They had features that customers were asking about too. So doing it organically has been has really worked for us. And then starting with our, our few stores, we're now selling in not only Whole Foods, but also in varied sales channels. And I always suggest and, um, you know, recommend that people do the same. So Whole Foods has been an amazing partner for us, and we've grown systematically with them. But working with Andronico's and Good Earth, also with online retailers, if um, any of you are, are, are not, maybe you're not ready 
to start selling directly to a big retailer, working with someone like Good Eggs may be, um, may be a great option for you. And Good Eggs is great because you can offer things just for specific seasons. Um, they really care. As a matter of fact, it's one of the requirements to work with them. Your product needs to be made locally or grown locally. So they've been a really good partner for us. Williams Sonoma has been great because it's been able to help us with a national, uh, developing a national presence. And this is just a side note, please, too. It, it, it's not necessarily about breaking into retail, but one of the things I always suggest for people is early on, once you decide who those going to be and, um, you know, your brand, just to remember that you invest a lot in that. So if you can get a trademark on your logo, Again, offering your product online interstate. These are things that down the road you're going to be happy that you did because you you know you build that brand and your logo is the face of the brand. And if you have a record of you know selling it and making it available nationally online, it's something that's going to find it's um, you know the trends of bigger companies that are wanting to um, to look artist and they may like your logo too. So to have that, um, to have that history, to kind of cross your eye, cross cross your T's and dot your eyes now will be helpful down the road. Um, so getting started with Whole Foods. So now we're at the nitty gritty. So I started, I launched, um, I started my company in 2009, did R&D for about a year, and then met Harv. Harv was very modest when he was talking about what he does, but he's very very important in Whole Foods. Um, he was my first contact with them. Um, I met him with a group of other vendors, and he was very helpful in that he gave a lot of really good honest feedback. So all of us, he looked at all of our products and had feedback for each one of us. You know, some of us, including myself, he, <laughs> he said, we're not ready for the show. And he gave me really good constructive feedback. He said, you know, all this is great, but how are you different? And, you know, this is a category. And, I mean, such, such important information that I needed and said, you know, make these changes or just, you know, just just important information, you know, if you do these things. Like I didn't have nutrition facts. And, you know, this kind of um, helpful tidbits helped me for when I was ready for that second meeting with him. And, when we did meet the next time, he said, okay, now you're ready, you know, and I'll, I'll make that introduce, introduction to you to the first, for, the, for the first buyer. And that's how it got started. So I met with him. Um, he said, yeah, I think you're ready. I called a uh, two Whole Foods buyers right here in San Francisco, one in Nelly Valley and one in Petrero Hill. They took the meetings with me after I told them some of the ways that I'm different. So all of you. You really need to have, like, those, you know, that elevator pitch or those three or four things that really make you unique and different so that they can take time out of their super, super busy schedule to meet with you and have a meeting, and I started with two stores. And at first, believe me, I did not want to go the two-store route. I wanted to, um, you know, have her see my product and say, yes, I'm going to put it in all 40 stores in the region. But... Looking back, I'm so grateful and so happy that we did not do it that way, that we were able to really start slowly. It was the right fit and the right speed for us for many reasons. We were able to um, really work out the kinks of, of owning a food business. You know, it's uh, having a product that's selling in the grocery stores. It's seven days a week. You know, you can get the grocery stores are open seven days a week, so you can get a call about something any of those days, and I had decided to make myself available for all of that. So starting out slowly was helpful. It also helped us to slowly build a customer base and to build that loyalty. Whatever your product is, you know, I always say getting into the stores, as hard as that may be, is actually easy. <laughs> That's the easy part. You know, I mean, it's it's difficult, but you get into the stores, you just sell you're just selling to one person essentially the buyer but when you're in the stores you need to continually validate why you have this space that shelf space is, is very expensive for for any store it's basically like you're renting the space you need to show that you know 
they made the right decision by approving your pro by approving to sell your product there. So what we how we did that was really supporting the sales in the stores. And we did that via demos. Um we didn't we started we bootstrapped this company. We didn't have a lot of startup capital. So I personally would go into the stores every week, meet with customers, let them taste the product, um and really get to know us and, and you know, have a connection with us and, and get to understand why our product was different. It also gave me time to ramp up our production. So, you know, when I first started, I used to be able to make four cases in a day. I would work 12 hours and make four cases of hummus. It was very slow. I didn't come from a food, a food background. I wasn't a chef. So it was very slow, and then eventually I was able to ramp that up so that it would it would make sense and become a business and, and not just a hobby. And proving my sales in those first two stores made those second meetings with new with the next set of buyers much easier. After about two months in the first two stores, I had shown how much I was able to sell. I wasn't again someone just doing this as a hobby. I could say, look, you know, we started super crowded category, and now we're outselling this brand that is owned by a national corporation. So really showing and, you know, talk is cheap those days of showing that you're willing to really do what it takes to get behind your brand. So from two stores, we grew into um, about half the stores in the region, and we're selling really well, and then we're able to meet with the regional buyer at Whole Foods, and Harv was was very helpful with that. He helped to set up that meeting after he was able to look at our movement reports and, and see that we were selling through. And um, he set up a meeting with the regional buyer, and they decided to place us regionally. But in order to do that, we needed a local producer loan. And Harv didn't go into detail about it, but um, for me, I can tell you as a vendor, that was very key and very important to us um, in helping with that money. We were able to use it to buy some equipment and to get some additional um, just logistical matters taken care of and certifications and um, new labels and new new inventory. And it was it was really, really helpful for us. And with that money, we were able to use this to support our ability to grow regionally. And then recently, we just started selling into uh, Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, and Hawaii, which we're super excited. It's been a long, long journey, but um, very happy to, to be able to do that. But it was very slow. Um, there are different ways to sell to Whole Foods, as I talked about earlier. I mean, we started the bootstrapping way. Two stores, you don't get any smaller than that, except for maybe if we started in one store. And then went throughout the region. And then now we're in a second region. Some companies, depending on how much startup capital you have um, and, and how big your, you know, your, your network is already, you may be able to start out selling regionally or nationally. That wasn't the step, the, the path for us, and, and I'm happy our path was exactly the way it was. We also, by working with Whole Foods, um, were able to show to other um, local co-ops and um, other amazing stores that we, you know, we were a brand to that they were, um, they should look at. So we now sell in New Leaf and Andronico's, Berkeley Bowl, Staff of Life, and these are all stores that are really, really care about organic, care about working with local producers, and were good fits with us. Not all stores are like this. Um, many stores uh, have pretty big cost of entries into the market. So um, they may charge things. There was one store we did a um, we had a sales call with, and they wanted these really, really high. For us, they seem very high, $25,000 slotting fees per SKU. So for a company like like us, that's we're, we're not that's not something that's going to work for us. For a big company, like if you're Dannon, you know, yogurt, or if you're Pepsi, or you're, you know, um, Frito-Lay or something, that's no problem. But for an artisan company, um, company like us, it, it it wasn't it wasn't something that we were we were open to. Um, also, selling online, 
selling online is a, is a great way to get started. So, again, if you're not ready to start selling at retail and you want to just do it a little bit slower, working with a company like Good Eggs is great, um, a great start. Um, and I'm seeing some questions here. I don't have a global con. Oh, yeah, I don't know if that's for me. Uh, farmers markets as well. The only farmers market we really worked at was the ferry building, um, and we do those periodically. Um, for me, I do that more not so much as a as a as a big revenue stream for us, uh, stream for us, but mostly to connect with the customers and to meet other growers and suppliers. Um, again, when you have these meetings, it's really, really, really important, and this is. Um, when you have those meetings, you really want to know how you're a good partner for retailers. So when you get ready and, you know, harvest, right, every store is empowered, every buyer for whatever department your product would be sold in, they are empowered to decide whether they want to carry your product or not. But when you have those meetings and those initial phone calls with them to set up the meetings, you really want to know how you're going to – they want to know how you're going to be a good partner and why – it's going to make sense for them to choose to carry your product. They have thousands and thousands of, of suppliers that they can choose from. Why are you special? What are you going to do to get behind your product? For us, it was investing in and supporting sell-through. And how we did that was through demos. And not just demos, but also um, Whole Foods or Staff of Life, Different stores often have events, community events that they may sponsor, and sometimes they'll have tables there, and to, to really be part of that community and to be a good partner. So you're showing your support for the store, but you're also connecting with your customers and supporting that sell-through. So it's not about how, you know, when you think about it, don't think so much about how they can help you, but how you can help them sell more, too. So, and in a sense, I mean, obviously that's good for your own company, but that's a, a really um, important place to, to think from. Uh, the next thing is, you know, do you have a compelling story? Is your branding accessible and attractive, you know, depending on where you're going to sell? You know, do you have something that people often, before they taste your product, they eat with their eyes? So is what you're presenting attractive to the, to the customers? Um, and then also... This is something for me, too. Our hummus is, although it's the best value, it is the most expensive. So your product, many artists and producers, you're never going to be as cheap as somebody, you know, something that's made by Pepsi-Cola. You're just not, and unless you're a big, uh, you know, you're owned by a huge company. It's very difficult to have something that is the, the, the lowest cost product on the shelf. But that's not necessarily what customers want, especially the customers that are willing to invest into products that are, are certified organic or have these extra features and are grown in California instead of perhaps another place. So, you know, having that increased penny profit. So, for example, for my product, if it sells for $6 on the shelf, if a retailer margin is 40%, do you want 40% of $6, even if it maybe it doesn't sell quite as many units as something that's $2, and they're getting 40% on that? So, the, you know, understanding that penny, the, the profit uh, that they're going to get from having a premium priced product, and so when you go into these meetings, you're aware of this and you've thought about it. Um, as well, you know, to really think about how you're going to connect with customers, just as I said, getting into the stores is, as difficult as that may be, that's the easy part. Really, um, you know, connecting with customers and and helping them to 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 make the decision about whether they want to choose your product every week instead of someone else's is the most important the most important thing for the long term success of your company. Mm -hmm. And we've done that through in store demos, promotional sales, community events. Um, we also have some online instructional videos. A lot of people. You know, we'll look up new products online. These uh, videos have been really helpful and with social media outreach. And that is, that's it. But if any of you have any questions, um, please feel free to email me. Um, and I will be very happy to, um, yeah, to help or answer in any way that I can. And if I don't know the answer, I'll direct you to somebody who can.
Thank you so much, Donna. That was really awesome, and we really appreciate you sharing your story with us here today. Um, there are a couple of questions that have been um, kind of written in. If other folks have questions, feel free to chat or use the question and answer function. And if you want to raise a, your hand and ask a question, hopefully you can do that as well. So one question, Donna, um, you do sell online. So what? how did you create the relationships with the online vendors? And what are your suggestions for getting into online stores? Yeah, so online, you know, what I would recommend is uh, the, the most, direct and the, the I guess whole, good eggs is designed to be a local food, you know, to support local food. That is their mission and they are really, really committed to that. They don't sell products that aren't made or at least have the main ingredients that are grown here. So for to sell online with good eggs, my recommendation is just to call them and to, to really consider a lot of what I shared here, like know how you're different know what are special features about your company and say, I have this great product. When can I come in and give you some samples? Um, they that they sell online. They're basically an online farmer's market. Um, so that would help for the local sales. If you want to start selling nationally, it's very easy to set up on your own company website um, an online store with WordPress now. They have templates to make it easy so you, you can do that as well. And then, you know, look around online, like find online retailers. There's one um, we're talking to now, skills.com. So, you know, what kind of, what are the online retailers that you like? Usually they have a contact us section and, in, and write them an email and say, hey, you know, I have this great product. Again, this is what makes us special. And can I talk to a buyer? And that's what I did and that's what's been, been helpful for us. Thanks, Donna. Your stories are really encouraging because you're just, you know, you're really ballsy. You're like ready to go for it <laughs> to, to put it all out there. So I really, you know, I appreciate that about your story, and thank you so much for sharing. We're going to um, continue on here and um, hear a bit from uh, Jessica Rolf, who's the CEO of Happy Family. Um, so, Jessica, we're going to unmute you here. Um, and we're going to, you know, give you the controls, and hopefully you'll be able to scroll on through. Sounds great. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Donna. That was a really, um, it's really fun to hear about a fellow entrepreneur in the in the food industry. And I um, have read about, uh, looked at the list of participants, and it's it sounds like we're all on the same path of a passion for the natural products industry and um, and what we want to create in the world in that industry. So, very exciting. So. Um, my story is uh, is a little bit different in the sense that we um, have a different market that we're dealing with. So, um, in with baby food, it's it's very difficult to create a local business that then can scale. Um, we we really needed to have some scale from the start because of the safety requirements and because of the population. There just actually aren't that many babies born every year, and they only eat baby food for a short period of time. So. Um, so that's sort of the backdrop of our company. Um, we started our company, uh, my partner thought of the idea about 10 years ago, and I joined her a couple years after that, and we launched eight years ago on Mother's Day. And um, last year, one year ago, and coincidentally on Mother's Day, it was kind of incredible, we sold our business to Group Danone, which is Danon U.S. So, Donna, you were mentioning, you know, if you're Danon, <laughs> so now we have um, – some, some major support um, and some backing from a large large company, but they also have some deep expertise in baby food, and they just didn't have any brands in the U.S. that, that they were working with. So Group Danone is a French company. They're very um, socially responsible, great mission, great vision, and, um, and they have a baby division that's number two in the world but didn't have any U.S. presence. So it's really honestly very much been a dream come true, but – what I want to tell you today is not kind of about um, sort of platitudes of success, and I, I really want to get into the nitty-gritty on how we got started and how we got retail distribution. Um, we currently sell our products nationally in Whole Foods and Target, HEB, Wegmans, Publix, you know, a lot of online accounts. Um, so we've got a lot of distribution, but um, but it all started with a couple of stores. So. Um, so I'm going to tell you about some of the huge challenges that we went through. I, my personal story is I got my MBA from Cornell, and I started working with um, with Whole Foods in Texas and natural purchasing. So I had a different dream for a, a, a food business 
based in Austin. Um, it's kind of a, a sidebar, but wanted my husband's friend survived cancer in, in college, and he became involved with the Lance Armstrong Foundation. And it's it's been so interesting being close to him and watching him through this most recent um, re, you know, crisis of reputation and the organization and what they're going through. But um, but we we had an idea to my husband and I had an idea to create a business that that would make um, food for cancer survivors and the uh, all the proceeds would go to the Lance Armstrong Foundation. So we were focusing on health and wellness and um, and trying to create an optimal food diet, you know, diet um, for cancer prevention, and with the same model as Newman's Own. And so that's brought me to Austin, Texas, and brought me to working to whole food working for Whole Foods and got me very interested in the natural products industry. And it turns out that the Yellow Bracelet campaign happened uh, oh so many years ago, and, and the Lance Armstrong Foundation at the time was um, was just minting money from these bracelets in China, and they had they, they ultimately had no interest in, in having the ri a risky food venture. So, um, so we had to, I had to start over. Um, a year after starting my job with Spins and at Whole Foods, I decided to quit quit my job um, because I just really had that entrepreneurial bug. I really wanted to start a business from scratch and something that I could truly believe in. So my heroes, I'd always wanted to be a social entrepreneur. So my heroes were people like Seth Goldman, um, who you guys know from Honest Tea. He's, he's a, 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 been a friend in the industry. He created his first batch of tea in his bathtub and, um, and then turned it into a company um, Worth you know worth hundreds of millions of dollars and, and has really stayed true to his mission. And then of course we all know Anita Roddick, um, human rights activist who who built the Body Shop. Um, and you know these people in my mind created you know did more than creating a business for profit, but they used their business as a tool for social good. So in the summer of 2005, I left Whole Foods to join uh, my partner Shazi, and she had an idea to create something new in the marketplace: fresh organic baby food. So I loved her idea because I have a passion for health food. I had suffered from some digestive problems earlier in my life, and and I really realized the true power that food has to heal. Um, also, as we all know, allergies and eczema and obesity and autism are just, you know, an epidemic rates in our country. And so I really believe that food has the power to heal and that a lot of um, the issues that children are facing can be linked to overprocessed foods. So... Plus, um, the baby food category at the time was dominated by Gerber and Earth's Best. And um, jars were the format, and we really felt like the modern mom could have a modern, needed a modern alternative. So I moved to New York City, um, and my husband followed um, after he graduated from, from his, his program, and, uh, and we co-founded the business, um, my Shazi and I did. Um, so in the beginning, we had these recipes in, in blenders where we had mixed up like spinach, mango, and pear, and butternut squash and apples, and we had all these um, really fun recipes. But it was my job to figure out how could we make fresh baby food viable to sell nationwide. And again, we had to sell nationwide because um, there's 4 million babies born every year, and there's a very limited market for premium baby food. Um, so... So this was uh, this was my big challenge. So I plunged in and I started teaching myself about food science. So this is an, a pH meter. If um, if any of you have, uh, I think Donna might know about this and know about the acidity and um, of hummus. I think that it's um, making something taste good and fresh is a challenge. So um, so I just but I soon discovered that we we really didn't have a viable business model. So it just wasn't going to work to sell fresh baby food nationwide. And maybe some of you guys could have told me that if I had um, known. It. It's, it's kind of an obvious thing. Um, but we decided to then create a frozen baby food. And this is our first, um, this is our yes, peas, and thank you carrots. Um, but it, this ended up being a risky choice for a number of reasons. First, we were asking consumers to change behavior. They were used to buying baby food in jars, and we were asking them to go to the freezer. Um, second, as you all probably know from going to your natural food stores, the freezer sections in natural food stores are, are really small, so our core market is notoriously small. 
And we knew we'd be competing for space with, you know, top sellers like Amy's and frozen pizza and ice cream. Um, but we had to get a product to the market, so we decided to go for it. So we had come up with the name Happy Baby, um, and we had a logo, uh, and and then we needed to find a factory. Um, and this one, this was one of the most challenging things for us in getting started because we didn't want to make it in our home. We didn't feel like that was wasn't scalable from the beginning, and we also were worried about safety and quality standards. Um, but we could not find a facility that was willing to make food for the most vulnerable population, infants. Um, and so we finally got a break. We had networked with someone we knew from the natural foods industry, and he believed in our vision, and he agreed to take a risk and let us produce in his little, he had a small factory um, up in the Boston area. And so this was our first big break, and Shazi and I were like Laverne and Shirley on the line. She would, she would do the peas, and I would do the carrots. Um, and we had a special machine called a one-up depositor that would squirt the baby food into um, – into each cavity of the tray. So, um, so we leased we leased our first machine, and um, and so at this point we we needed to break into retail, and um, we really wanted to launch in Whole Foods in New York City. Our dream was the Columbus Circle store, and as much as we tried, and even with my connections from from working there at the regional office and the, with the, at the national office, knowing the regional buyers. Um, we just couldn't convince the buyer to take us. So um, my, we had a connection through my husband who had gone to school with someone who knew someone and um, ended, up, uh, ended up getting us connected to Gourmet Garage. Um, so we had an inn, and we were able to secure five Gourmet Garage stores and Fresh Direct for our launch on Mother's Day. Um, and one of the tricks, and I'll just go back for a second, um, this is – one of the, the hard parts was to actually get our frozen food distributed from the um, from the factory in Boston down to New York City. And New York City is a notoriously tricky, obviously, place to distribute food. So we were thinking maybe we could put it in our car and coolers. Or maybe we could, you know, could we figure something out? But um, we ended up getting connected with a very small distributor through the retailer. So the retailer connected us to a distributor um, called McMahon's, and they were great, and they helped us get started. Um, and so it was just such an incredible feeling to see our, our products in the freezer on launch day. Um, and so we got uh, all of our friends to buy our product, and um, and a lot of them did not have – babies. A lot of them just had, uh, were willing to just support us, but we wanted to make sure that the product um, had movement. We did demos. Um, we were in the stores, those five stores, all the time um, and doing, t talking the product up as much as we could, could with friends. Um, so then after a couple of months, we got a big break and we got connected to a buyer at Target through somebody that we knew that we had networked with who was a salesperson at Izzy Beverage. Um, and so he said, you know, I think my buyer might be, you know, might be interested. And his buyer forwarded it to the frozen buyer, um, and, we, and, and Target actually was interested, and they contacted us. So this was an incredible break. Um, and so they took us in a 24-store test. So um, we also had a lot of friends making requests for our products at Whole Foods stores across the country. So we would send blast emails and follow-up blast emails and submitting, asking them to submit um, requests for the each, you know, for this at the store level to carry Happy Family. Um, you know, this is a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm self-conscious because Jade is on the line maybe still, but, um, you know, we certainly don't want to to uh, game the system, but being able to have people that love your product or know your product um, request in a store can make a huge difference um, because a lot of the stores are really responsive, you know, very responsive to their to their customers, especially Whole Foods. Um, <clears throat> but I will never forget because we finally got the buyer at the Whole Foods Columbus Circle store to meet with us, and he um, and he'd agreed because he had said he'd gotten so many requests all of a sudden for Happy Baby. And as we were saying goodbye to the buyer, I don't know if you know, but there's this huge um, escalator, long escalator, and a friend of mine was coming down and, and saw me, and he was pretty far away still, so he had to yell, and he waved, and he was like, hey, hey, Jess, I submitted that request that you asked me to do, you know, for Happy Baby, and the buyer um, was, like, looking at me like, 
what, is, what, what is going on here? But anyway, he still agreed to take our, our product. Um, and then at the time, we had um, we had also, because the food was so unusual and so beautiful, we were able to get a lot of great press. So we'd, um, we worked with a small local PR firm called Organic Works Marketing, um, but we also got a lot of press on our own just because the category was interesting. Nothing had really been happening in the baby food category for um, since like the 1930s, really, when Gerber launched their jars. And so, um, so there was a lot of potential for us to to um, get get press and get noticed, and it was really an exciting part of and really helped accelerate us. Um, so, so then we had to succeed. So we're in these stores, and this is our first. Um, uh, we we finally invested in a, in a we were able to invest in a more complex machine, and um, but bad news our frozen baby food actually wasn't selling. So um, as you can see, it's like this is a Target set. It was near the Green Giant vegetables, and it's just it's like so hard to see. Um, so sadly, it's on clearance. Um, so we needed time. You know, we really needed to buy time to come up with a with another new idea. So. We created a community marketing program where we hired our mom friends to do demos and talk us up at mom groups and events. And if things really weren't good at a store, in the short term, we um, we asked them to just help us by buying the product regularly so that we could buy some time and keep the space. Um, I also started making regular trips to my hometown in Minnesota to make sure that the test went well. So my dad and I, my dad had an old station wagon with a huge dashboard, and it was like we would joke that it was my mobile office. But we got a AAA map and, um, and marked every one of the 24 stores in the test and then would drive to the store. I would get a cart and fill it up with Happy Baby, um, have a bunch of free coupons, and would just cold approach pregnant pregnant women and moms in the store one by one and, and tell them about our product And um, because we couldn't do demos in Target stores. So we had to take it grassroots. Um, and my dad would actually like m be my scout, and so he would, he would um, go ahead and he would point to me down the aisle and say, hey, there's, you know, there's somebody up here. Um, he thought it was a little creepy to have like an older man approaching young mothers in the store. So, um, so we decided um, to try and succeed uh, so short term, and the sales would spike when, when, when I was in town and we would do this, and then they would dip again. So we really didn't have a sustainable proposition. Um, but then we discovered um, that we needed a product in the dry aisle, and there was no infant cereal that truly incorporated the best of um, science, meaning um, choline, which is really important for memory. Um, DHA, as a lot of you all know, um, really important for brain and eye development, and then pre and probiotics in an organic cereal. So there was all the, all the goodies were in the Gerber cereals, but there was no combined organic cereal that had the best of both worlds. So we launched our Happy Belly cereal, and it was an immediate hit. Um, we also got really lucky because Earth's Best had a supply problem, and so we just we were able to take over the shelves um, in the cereal set at at all the Whole Foods stores, and it was um, it was a huge success. And then we um, then we we really we created pops with without chemical flavors and freeze-dried yogurt melts, and we created a bunch more snacks over the years. And then we truly discovered, um, when we discovered the, this pouch format, which has its complexities, it's, um, we wish that it was recyclable and we're working on that, but um, it's multi-layered and so it's, it's not this time. But, um, but it's been such a huge convenient, um, convenient package for parents, and it's also a great way to get children to eat um, vegetables and fruits where they weren't before. So we're really creating an alternative um, for, um, for today's young family. But it required a lot of pivoting and a lot of, um, you know, really, really being flexible with our product offering, flexible with um, our production, flexible with our business strategy, and, um, and ultimately we were able to succeed. But I think it, you know, sometimes you may need to, you know, I think from, from our lessons, really listening to consumers and hearing what they wanted, they ultimately did not want the most, you know, the, this perfect food that we created in the freezer section that moms either wanted to make homemade or they wanted the convenience of the pouch. So so that is um, that is our story. 
Thank you, Jessica. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And again, just like Donna, it's it's really um, it's great to see the commonalities in your stories as far as just being incredibly tenacious and being like, well, that didn't work. We're going to try a different tack, even if it means driving in a station wagon to all the targets in the Midwest. So I really I appreciate you sharing your story. We do have uh, time for some questions, so if folks want to chat in and uh, use the question and answer section and or if they want to raise their hand. Um, we have a couple that all have already come in, Jessica. So one is um, tips for how to plan for volumes um, for future years. So, you know, if you are looking to scale up, how, you know, what did you guys, what was your volume management strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. We had a lot of problems. Um, it's so tricky when you're growing fast. Um, we we still struggle with it, but um, but what we one of our biggest challenges is that we need to contract with farmers to um, to lock in the raw materials up to 18 months in advance. So we'll need to contract with a farmer to say that we want sweet potatoes or spinach, um, and they make it to our specifications. So you know, really. Um, to baby grade and specific to us and organic in a certain a certain way and um, and they'll need to you know to need to plant and expect that we're going to be buying that product so we have to uphold our commitments and there have been some years where we've been really long and some years we've been really short um, it is it is it is really tricky but I would say um, you've got to plan for success so you know you you know you can't um, if it's a scarce ingredient or something that you have you know you have trouble sourcing um, you've got to you've got to protect your business and, and hope you know and really plan that that it is going to be successful otherwise you know there's no chance because you won't you know won't have what you need to make your food got it um, another question is are you still selling frozen foods or no you know we finally discontinued it a couple years ago it was actually really sad we came out with a, a frozen kids line and um, lots of lots of uh, you know um, Lots of, we had lots of frozen ideas, but the frozen food aisle for us has has been a struggle. I think it's because it's a specialty market. You know, child, babies and toddlers are only eating, you know, foods for a certain period of time. You really, to succeed in frozen, you really need something that people will be buying um, that's appealing to all ages um, to succeed in that valuable space. The retailers just, um, they can't afford to, it's too expensive to run those freezers and not have something that's turning turning really well. So sadly, we did discontinue it a couple of years ago. We we hung on for a lot of years. And then uh, one last question is, uh, where did you find your packaging? So can you talk a little bit about the move to the pouches and, and where that packaging came from? Yeah. Um, well, the in, yes, in the first packaging, it was actually really tricky because that, that tray of frozen cubes, um, it was really difficult to kind of you know, we felt like that was the most convenient because it really mimicked mom's the way that mom made it. But started just making random phone calls, and we actually won a grant from Eileen Fisher for women entrepreneurs, and we spent our ten thousand dollars on the mold for that tray, that that twelve cube tray that you saw in the in the images before. So, um, so that was you know a lot of just really literally phone calls, cold calling, you know, a, t a ton of um, research to just try and figure out who would actually be able to make. You know, I didn't know anything about that packaging. And then the pouch package was actually an invention in Italy, a combination between a Japanese company and an Italian company. And these pouches have been popular in Europe and Asia for quite a while, but we were among the first brands to bring them to the U.S. So, um, so it was really um, exciting, but the packaging already exist, did exist and the, the equipment existed, and so it was about trying to you know, find a facility that, could, that was willing to make it happen. Got it. Thank you so much, Jessica. There's a couple of questions now uh, for Jana who, that have come in um, just about organic things, so we're going to turn it over to Jana here in our CCOF office. Um, Jana, uh, somebody asked, will the standards for getting certified be stable or increase in stringency and difficulty in the future as far as um, being certified organic? That's a good question. Um, they should stay pretty consistent. I mean, every year there are some changes that come about. Um, as far as getting products certified, I don't see many changes as far as like what can get certified or ingredients you can use. Those are probably the same. But there are some changes as far as like um, facilities, like if you're using a co-packer, um, they have to be certified um, or you have to lease or own it. Um, so there are some changes about that, uh, about that that are coming. Um, 
So, um, but otherwise, it should should remain pretty consistent. And then a second question that folks had is is packaging a factor in a certified organic, um, like maybe what the material is made of. Um, right now, not really. Um, you could pretty much use anything, um, but of course, we always love it when clients use sustainable packaging or environmental environmentally friendly packaging. All right, thanks so much, Jana. Well. Um, just in case you're interested, um, CCUF does um, do these types of educational uh, programs um, pretty regularly, so you can check out our education page uh, for upcoming trainings. Um, there's going to be a pop-up window when you exit this um, webinar that's got a little evaluation. would really appreciate it if you filled it out. We do like to get feedback about how our educational events are going. If you're interested in certification, um, this is our certification coach, Joan, uh, Jane Wade, and she um, can help you figure out all different types of aspects of organic certification. And um, lastly, thank you so much for being on the line. We really appreciate your presence here, and uh, we wish you all the best with breaking into retail. And that's it. Thanks so much.